We're very excited to welcome to the stage Bob Martin of Object Mentor. Bright lights. So the title of my talk today, oh wait, before I do that, Aslak, are you here? Come on up here. <laughs> that timer can start now. It says one hour. Oh, you can keep it at one hour for as long as you want. Do you want to speak as well? No, you don't need to speak. <laughs> I don't think anyone wants to hear from you. Would you spread your hands out like this? No, not for me. Yeah, no, 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 no. Okay. Yeah, good, good. Okay, all right. So, fine. Uh, yeah. uh, rotate like so. Good hands out, uh, Jesus style. Good. All right. So, <laughs> imagine that the width of Aslak's arms are the lifespan of the Earth, uh, roughly five billion years from here to here. This is where we are right there, and here is the solar nebula just about to contract. Now, somewhere right around here, there was a supernova about six billion years ago. Some star in our general neighborhood decided to blow its guts up all over the sky, and the shock wave of that event smashed into a cloud of neutral hydrogen right about here and caused it to start to collapse. We actually have grains of the material from that original supernova, or at least we think they are, embedded into comets and things like that. You'll have to hold your hands up. Nice. Good. Okay. So, <laughs> right here is where the collapse begins. Now, the collapse is pretty quick. The sun actually ignites within a few tens of millions of years, so that's even before the first knuckle here. And the sun, once it ignites, it pushes all the gas and dust out. There's a lot of radiation. It's all right, it's all right, it's all right. It's all right. A lot of radiation pressure and stuff like that. The planets form roughly around the first knuckle, and there's a ton of collisions. This is not a nice place to live during this period of time. There are collisions amongst all of the planets. The Earth is growing by collision. There are perhaps, up to the middle knuckle here, there are perhaps seven major events which completely melt the Earth over and over again because there's collisions with objects that are several hundred miles in diameter. At some point, however, the Earth cools and life begins. Life probably begins right around here. About 250 million years in, the first hints of life are there. But they get wiped out because there are still collisions happening all the time. Massive collisions. But eventually those collisions slow down. Whatever life does manage to hide deep down in the, in the Earth comes back up and survives. And we wind up with a period which is fairly long where virtually nothing happens. Life is there. It's not doing much. It's anaerobic. There's no oxygen. Uh, photosynthesis, maybe that starts around here. But the photosynthesis can't do much because any oxygen it puts into the atmosphere uh, gets bound to iron. The iron falls to the bottom of the sea. And it's essentially the ocean's rust until about here. So almost nothing is going on except about here. Right here, the Earth freezes solid. Just a total, total freeze over, ice covering absolutely everything for about 10 or 15 million years. And then the Earth thaws. And this thaw, freeze, thaw, freeze happens over and over again. The last one about here. This one, big thaw, freeze event, uh, the oxygen levels have now risen to the point where they are maybe three times what they are uh, now. Uh, right now we've got about 20% oxygen, but then there was like 50 or 60% oxygen. Fires just happened because they thought they ought to. Uh, <laughs> there was hardly, you know, a very, very caustic time to live. Life got very large. Here is where life finally came out of the ocean. Here is where the dinosaurs roamed the Earth. Here is where the dinosaurs got destroyed. Here. 
Okay, good. I could remove the entirety of human civilization with one quick stripe. Thank you. Thank you. I save that for people who do me wrong. So, <laughs> what killed small talk and could it kill Ruby? Now, why would I even mention small talk in this, in this uh, context? Well, small talk and Ruby are deeply related. Uh, Kent calls Ruby small talk without the image. Uh, some of you know what that means. The rest of you will wonder for a very long time. Uh, much of the style of Ruby is similar in many ways to the style of small talk. So in some sense, Ruby is a reincarnation of small talk with a little bit of C-ish-like syntax, a very small amount. Is small talk dead? Before we can talk about what killed it, is it dead? There was a time when small talk was the language to watch uh, during the late 70s, through the 80s, into the 90s. Small talk was the language everybody wished they could program in, but nobody dared, except for a few people who did dare. There were some pretty impressive projects that were done in Ruby. There were massive financial projects done. There were uh, CIA projects that, that snooped phone lines and snooped uh, network status and things like that that were written. There were pension projects that were written. There were payroll projects that were written. But perhaps the most impressive from the point of view of uh, an interpreted language like Smalltalk is the oscilloscope, the digital oscilloscope at Tektronix, which had a small talk core, which flew in the face of the whole notion that, well, small talk's too slow or small talk just can't do embedded. Of course it can and did. What happened? Why did small talk suddenly, pretty suddenly, just stop? It's certainly not alive now. No one is contemplating major uh, projects in small talk any longer. Who's a squeak programmer here? We, we got people doing squeak? I can't see a damn thing out there. Well, I presume there's one or two people with their hands in the air. Squeak has uh, kind of fallen into an academic language. Uh, no one's really considering anything serious. Oh, I'm starting to deal from the bottom of the deck. That wouldn't be a good idea. Smalltalk, in its time, was at the forefront of object-oriented design. Uh, it was the language that kind of characterized or epitomized what OO was really about. Uh, there were other languages that were OO, but they were only sort of OO. And of course, I'm talking about languages like C++ or Objective-C. Those were the two major competitors oh, during the, say, mid-80s, mid to late 80s. C++, I presume there are some old C++ programmers out there. C++ is a man's language. <laughs> you, know, you have to have serious cojones to sling that code around. Right? You don't. You, there's testosterone running through every line of that code. Java's more of an estrogen-like language. <laughs> uh, uh, Weak, insipid kind of la By the way, I'm a Java programmer nowadays. 80% of the code I write is in Java because that seems to be the language that everybody's using. And I have a lot of projects that I work on written in, in Java. But it doesn't give me anywhere near the, the stone thrill of making a C++ application work. C++ programmer is the wild hunter that stabs the boar in the heart with a spear. You get that program to work, you have felled the mighty mammoth. <laughs> C++ and Objective-C and eventually Java and C-sharp were followers. The small talk led them. The, these languages learned from small talk. Anybody doing Objective-C now knows that the syntax of Objective-C and many of the libraries come directly from the small talk world. 
Small talk ruled. It ruled in a way uh, that no other language could have at the time. Uh, it ruled uh, technically. There was a productivity enhancement. Capers-Jones measured it at perhaps a factor of five. Uh, a team of developers could get an application written and shipped five times faster than a C++ application or a C application. And those were measured things. That wasn't just Capers-Jones spouting off. He did measurements and he studied the way these projects went. A factor of five is fairly significant in our world. Smalltalk also ruled in ways that we're just beginning to grasp. How many of you, well, this is a Ruby conference, so I guess most of you aren't using refactoring browsers, but I am using a refactoring browser in Java, and I have a, a, a little bit of a refactoring browser for Ruby. I use uh, the IntelliJ Ruby plugin, which allows me to do uh, uh, rename. But <laughs> in Java, I can do amazing things with refactoring. The thing about that is, is that the Smalltalk people had that in the mid-90s. Their browsers and their IDEs were immensely powerful, uh, long before most of us had even thought of a refactoring browser. So small talk ruled in a whole bunch of interesting ways, and yet it died. What killed it? What killed it? I talked about how C++ was a testosterone language. I, I talked about how Java was kind of an estrogen language. Small talk was fairly non-hormonal. It didn't have this kind of you know, manly or, or insipid kind of feel. Small talk was more related to caffeine. You could get a lot done in small talk. It was, maybe we should relate it to oxytocin. You know, it caused labor to be stimulated. <laughs> who knows who Ward Cunningham is? I can't see you, but I do see the shadows of people waving. Oh, good. That's a good way to do it. Yes, yeah, shout. Shout. Excellent. Excellent. So, Ward, those of you who did not shout, let me explain to you who Ward Cunningham is, because it's somewhat surprising. Uh, Ward Cunningham is the inventor of things like the wiki, uh, design patterns. I can't claim that he's the complete inventor, but... He was involved at the very start of design patterns. It was he who read the book by Christopher Alexander in the first place and started circulating that meme around. Some of you don't know who Christopher Alexander is. You'll have to look that up and read it at the beginning of the design patterns movement. There was a moment in time when, when Ward Cunningham and Kent Beck were driving in a Volkswagen bus between Medford, Oregon and Portland, Oregon, and Ward starts to talk to Kent about... Christopher Alexander's work and the notion of design patterns was born at that, in that car at that moment. And they called a few people like Eric Gamma and John Vlasides and the notion of the book came about and the notion of the plop conferences came about and so on and so on. Ward was there at the start of that. Some of you may have heard of CRC cards. That was a Ward Cunningham invention. Some of you might have heard of extreme programming. That was a Ward Cunningham invention. Uh, some of you might have heard of FIT, the framework for integration testing. That was a Ward Cunningham invention. In fact, if you pluck at any of the threads in our industry, the major events in our industry for the last 20 years or so, you start plucking at them and pulling those threads, you will very likely find Ward Cunningham back at the beginning uh, who started the thread or was somehow involved in that thread. And yet hardly anybody knows who this guy is. This is a guy who sits in the back and he has a bunch of ideas. And he tosses those ideas around and other people run with them. Ward does not. Uh, that's probably because Ward has a lot of other interesting ideas, too. You should go to his website sometime and take a look at what's on there. Uh, Ward spent a very large amount of time uh, making a machine that would wave the American flag. <laughs> it's fun to watch it. And, you know, he did the whole technical thing. It's a double Lysacu pattern. It actually waves it in the proper figure eight configuration. None of this nasty, you know, back and forth nonsense. It was a proper wave. 
He was at a conference not too long ago, some of you will remember this, and he was walking around with these little blinking LEDs. And it, they were called uh, uh, electronic graffiti. He had a little battery, a little watch battery, and a little LED you soldered to it. And in between them, there was a little processor. And the processor controlled the blink rate of the LED. Oh, there was a magnet attached to them, too. The idea was that you'd take and throw these things against metal, metal objects, and they would stick there and make them look pretty. And he programmed his little, uh, this little processor to blink out the definition of graffiti in Morse code. <laughs> I once went to Ward's house, and he, he was very excited. He took me down in his basement. I'm a geek, too, so I was very excited to see whatever he was going to show me. And, and he sat me down, and, and he turned on a little switch, and some circles appeared on a TV set. And he said, isn't that cool? Yeah, Ward, that's cool. What are these circles? And then he proceeded to describe what he had done. Now, there is an algorithm that will generate circles within a video signal. And he knows this algorithm pretty well. So he wrote it in assembly language, and he proved that he could manipulate a video signal with a simple uh, A to D converter and uh, create circles on the screen. But that wasn't good enough. He then said, well, what I want to do is figure out how to do test-driven development in deeply embedded software and assembly language. So what he then did is he wrote the exact same algorithm in Java using test-driven development. And then he replaced all the function calls with assembly language code generators, and he ran the program again, generated the assembly language, burned that into his prom, and showed the circles on his uh, television. And if by this point you are going, what the hell is he talking about? Well, that's the kind of guy Ward is. <laughs> Linus Pauling once said, people ask me why I have so many good ideas. It's not that I have so many good ideas, it's just that I have a whole lot of ideas and some of them are good. That's Ward. <laughs> Oop, wrong card. I keep making sure I'm doing the right thing. I once asked Ward, a question. I asked him, Ward, what is clean code? I was in the middle of writing my clean code book. And I asked a whole bunch of people. I asked Grady Booch, I asked Dave Thomas, I asked Mike Feathers, I asked a whole bunch of people. Ward was one of them. And Ward said to me, clean code is when you look at a routine, he uses the word routine to describe software, so you know how old this guy is. When you look at a routine, and it's pretty much what you expected. <laughs> and I, you know, thanks a bunch, Ward. But then I thought about that. Because the thing about Ward is he will say things, and it's like, Ugh. and then you think, wait, what did he say? When was the last time that you saw a function that was pretty much what you expected? I mean, most of the time when you look at a function that other people write or that you wrote yesterday, you're going, what the f***? What? What? There's a metric. It's in my book. I, I stole it from a cartoon. The best metric for design refuse is WTFs per minute. <laughs> right? And words, what Ward said here was that clean code has a metric of zero. Zero WTF per minute. Everything is pretty much what you expected. Wouldn't that be great to go read somebody's code and go, yeah, mm hmm, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that's pretty what, yeah, 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 yeah. Almost boring. Wouldn't that be great? So when Ward says something, you can't just let it roll off your head like a, oh, whatever. You've got to go back and think about it because. Usually when Ward says something, there's some deep, profound truth behind it. I asked Ward at an immersion once, what was it that killed small talk? Actually, it wasn't me. It was someone else who asked Ward that question. Uh, did anybody here at immersions? XP immersions, I know Chad was at one. These were uh, our training courses that we taught, oh, 1999 through 2001. Uh, and we had you know, 60, 70, 80 people at these things. They were massive affairs. The first one was in Chicago in 1999. The next one was in uh, Monterey. The one in Monterey was at a hotel that had internet in it. 
We'd never even heard of anything like that before, but they had internet all throughout this hotel, and it was free. <laughs> the third immersion was in Terratown, New York, and the fourth, oh, the one in New York was cool, because Tom DeMarco was there, and he gave a keynote talk. That was one of the best keynote talks I've ever heard. And then Kent was there, and late one night, it was about 11 o'clock at night, and Kent goes to the bar, and somebody says to Kent, hey, Kent, can you show us how to do small talk? And Kent says, sure, and we all go back to the classroom, and people are literally filing into this classroom, 40, 50 people, sitting on the floor cross-legged with Kent projecting his, his visual, uh, visual age IDE on the screen, typing small talk, explaining what he was doing very few times. Have I seen such poignance in a simple coding display? It was, it was fairly remarkable. But Immersion 4, which was in Chicago in the fall of 2000, was when someone asked Ward, what killed small talk, Ward? I think this is the only immersion that Ward was at. Ward said, what killed small talk? is that it was just too easy to make a mess. He went on to say, you C++ programmers are lucky, because the language punishes you if you make a mess. Your builds start to take forever. You've got to undo some of the mess just to survive. But the small talk people could add mess upon mess upon mess with no ill, immediate, ill effects. Their builds didn't run any slower. There was no build. Right? There was nothing that went wrong with them. As long as they could manage to keep all the balls in the air, they were all right. But eventually you could build a system that was so indirect and so impenetrable and so convoluted that no one could understand it or touch it and it would uh, uh, become impossible to deal with. That was what Ward said. Now there's a whole bunch of other explanations for why small talk died. We could talk about the image uh, the fact that this language was actually written on top of a database and everything you ever typed went into that database so you could have objects floating around without any source code to, to describe them any longer. That was certainly a problem. And we could talk about how Java came along in 1995 and it was free. And so people went to the free language instead of the language that, that cost money. Or you could talk about the companies that were doing small talk or producing small talk and how screwed up they were, and they were. But Ward's answer was remarkable. It was just so easy to make a mess. Who among you has been significantly impeded by bad code in Ruby. You can make a mess in Ruby. Ruby is a wonderful language, an elegant language, a simple language. You, it's expressive. You can do all these wonderful things in it. And yet, it's easy to make a mess. How many of you have found that a project starts well, but then eventually it grows to the point where you have violated some basic assumption in the framework you are using? A framework like Rails or a framework like Active Record. And then you must go dig into that framework and try and understand what it is doing. And you find that you are tra chasing a trail of monkey patches to hell. Who's heard of the Boy Scout rule? Yeah, Boy Scout rule. Boy Scout rule is you enter a campground, you spend the night at the campground, you leave the campground cleaner than when you entered it. That's the Boy Scout rule. Actually, the Boy Scout rule uh, got that name because the father of the Boy Scouts, whose name I can't remember right now, uh, left them a message on his deathbed. It was a posthumous message, which was leave life better than you found it. Uh, but it's better to say the campground. It's easier for people to understand the notion of the campground. Like, 
So hey, leave the campground cleaner than when you found it. What if we all did this with our source code? Now, what if every time we checked it out, we did some random act of kindness to it <laughs> and checked it in cleaner than when we had checked it out? If everybody did that, our code would not get messier. It would not get more convoluted. It would not get worse and worse as time goes by. It would get better and better as time goes by. Uh, we would like to follow this rule, but... Most of the time, we don't. Why? Because cleaning code is hard. Cleaning code is risky. Who among you has seen code that you think, oh my god, I've got to clean this up, and your next thought is, I'm not touching it. <laughs> if you touch it, you will break it. And if you break it, it becomes yours. <laughs> and so the best policy is to walk away. Run. Do not clean up the mess. The messes are easy to make. They are hard to clean. But there is a way out of that. There is a discipline that helps that greatly, that makes the code much easier to clean. You know what I'm going to say. Who here is doing test-driven development? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Test-driven development is a discipline that has permeated the Ruby and Rails community far more than any other community, I believe. It is built into the, well, sort of built into the Rails framework. There's a tremendous amount of effort being put on by people trying to create testing frameworks and easy ways to test. So I am very encouraged by that. But I am not entirely encouraged. Because I think that this community is growing very rapidly. And the disciplines may not grow with it. Other languages certainly had test-driven development in it. Uh, Smalltalk was the birthplace, the incubator of test-driven development. The very first X-unit derivative. Uh, we can't call it an X-unit derivative because the very first one was the one that they were all derived from. It was called S-unit, Smalltalk unit. Kent wrote it a long time ago, a very, very long time ago. And people in Smalltalk started using it, not many. But some, there was a TDD community even in small talk. They didn't call it TDD at that time. They didn't know what to call it. And at various times, it was called Test First Design or Test First Programming. And eventually, this name TDD, Test Driven Development or Test Driven Design, no one knows which it is, uh, was born. That was probably 19, uh, or 2002, maybe 2001. What is Test Driven Development? Some of you know intimately, some of you, well, there's a lot of people here, so let's go through the rules of test-driven development. There are three laws of test-driven development. The first one everybody knows, you are not allowed to write a line of production code until you have written a failing unit test. This is called test first, and it is the, the rule that everybody kind of sniffs at and goes, well, does it really matter? I can write my tests after I write my code, but follow me for a moment. You are not allowed to write a line of production code until you have written a failing unit test. The second law is that you are not allowed to write more of a unit test than is sufficient to fail. You cannot write the whole unit test. As soon as that unit test fails, you must stop writing it. Now imagine that you have a little runner. And this little runner constantly runs your unit test. It's stuck in a hard loop. It never, ever stops. It's just always running your unit tests. And as you are typing production code, this little loop catches you in errors. You type things into, your, into TextMate or whatever you're using, and this little loop turns things red. Who's got one of those? Yeah, yeah OK. That, you thought I was joking, some of you. There are people that are actually doing that, the fools. Right? <laughs> No, actually, it's a good approach. I love the idea. You must stop when that thing turns red and make whatever production code change is necessary to make them turn green. So if you type the name of a class that does not yet exist, you must stop and then create the class, but you can't put anything in the class. You then have to go back to the test and add a method call, but you can't 
go on from that because you've got to add the method call to the production code. And then you go back to the test and you add a little bit more. And then you go back to the production code and add a little more and you are stuck in a loop. That loop is perhaps 30 seconds long. And you're going around that loop over and over. The third law is that you are not allowed to write more production code than is sufficient to pass the failing test. So you're stuck in this tight little loop. Programmers of any experience will say, well, that's just stupid. How could anybody get any work done that way? It would be slow. It would be tedious. Besides, I know how to write a line of code. I know how to write five lines of code. I can write 20 lines of code. Don't tell me I've got to go around this damn loop. Fine. Imagine a group of people working this way. Pick one. Doesn't matter who. Doesn't matter when. Sometime in the last minute or so, everything they were working on executed and passed all its tests. And it doesn't matter who you pick, and it doesn't matter when you pick them. Sometime in the last minute or so, everything they were working on executed and passed its test. What would life be like if every minute or so, everything executed and passed its test? What would programming be like if you had to plan your programming such that every minute or so, everything would execute or pass its test? How much debugging do you think you would do? The answer to that is, well, not very much. There's not a lot of debugging to do if you just executed it and passed its test a minute ago. If you do find a bug, well, you're going to find that bug pretty rapidly. So you might set a breakpoint here or there. Or you might step through the code here or there. But you're not going to spend long periods of time debugging. How many of you have gone through long, horrendous debugging periods, you know, hours and hours of setting breakpoints here and watch points there and making sure this one happens three times and then that one two times so that you can get to here, oh, too many times, start over. You don't do that. You don't do that in test-driven development. If you follow those rules, you will write dozens of tests every day, hundreds of tests every week, thousands of tests every year, and you will have those tests, and you will run those tests all the time. Now, here's the payoff. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you don't. If you have a batch of tests... And that batch of tests is something you can run at the click of a button. And that batch of tests tells you that virtually everything in your system works. How afraid are you to clean up that mess that scared you off? And the answer to that is you're not. Because you can look at the mess now and say, well, what if I just changed this? I'll just clean this up and I'll push the button. Oh, it still works. All right. Uh, change this thing. I'll push the button. Oh, it still works. Uh, uh, change. Oh, that broke it. All right, put that back. <laughs> the tests eliminate fear. The tests allow you to make changes without the risk of breaking something. You don't have to run away because you have the test. We talk an awful lot about the importance of design and architecture. We talk a lot about the need to make sure our system is well structured because we want our code to be flexible and maintainable. But nothing makes a system more flexible than a suite of tests by a huge order of magnitude. If you have a suite of tests, you are not afraid to change it. Even if you have a terrible design, if you have a suite of tests, you will not be afraid to improve the design. On the other hand, if you have a terrific design, but you have no tests, you will still be afraid. By the way, I really like RSpec. Anybody here use RSpec? I, I really like RSpec and Cucumber, and that whole behavior-driven development thing I think is very, very cool. Uh, whenever I do Ruby, which is not often enough as far as I'm concerned, uh, I get out the RSpec thing and I write little specs, because it's much better, I think, than writing uh, the t unit test kind of things that I would write in Java. Uh, it was just an advertisement. Yeah, I talked about that already. Test-driven development was invented in small talk, but never really became part of the culture. TDD has infiltrated the Ruby culture, 
but is it enough? Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, test-driven development is what will keep your code clean. You may think of yourselves as wonderful programmers who write clean code. That is not necessarily the case. Code is not ever clean. Code is cleanable. You can improve it, but only if you have tests. The tests allow you to clean the code. What is clean today may not be clean tomorrow because of changes elsewhere in the system. The structure of the system, the best structure for the system, is something that is instantaneous, not long-term. So as you make changes to the system in another part of the system, the code that was good last month becomes bad without even having to change it. It is the tests that will allow you to go back to that code and then clean it again, make it more consistent with the system. If you have tests, you are in control. If you don't have tests, you are not in control. You do not have control of your code base if you have not tests. What killed small talk? We talked about tests, but there's some other things we need to talk about. I'm going to use a word here, and I don't want you to take the word the wrong way. The one way you could take this word is evil, and the other way you could take this word is ignorant, not quite even ignorant. The word that I'm going to use is arrogance. There was an arrogance in the small talk community, not the evil kind but the kind that told them that they were somehow better, that the tools they were using were somehow better, that the things they were doing were somehow better. It was the arrogance of those people who believed that victory was inevitable. This was not the, the slap in your face, you stupid fool, C++ programmer kind of arrogance, although there was plenty of that too. Instead, it was a kind of arrogance of power, because the small talk people were riding a pretty powerful horse. They did have a tiger by the tail. It was a powerful engine. It was a powerful language. And they knew they could work miracles. And yet, that wasn't enough. Something insidious, something subtle happened. It caused a separation. They were set aside. The rest of the industry, the people who were writing everyday programs, began to look out of the corner of their eye at these small talk people going, eh, they don't seem to like us very much. I don't think we're going to like them. There were quite a few arguments that uh, appeared on the net. Some of you might remember the language wars of the mid-90s. I was actually at a plop once. The, uh, it was 1995. It was the very first PLOP conference. And for those of you who don't know what PLOP means, Pattern Languages of, of Program Design. They were the Design Patterns conferences. Kent Beck was there. Ken Auer was there. A bunch of other people were there. And I was in a, 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 a they, they were called writer's workshops. We were reviewing someone's pattern. And we were in the midst of this pattern. And Ken and Kent, Ken Auer and Kent Beck, started talking and they started snickering about C++. It wasn't anything significant. It wasn't anything evil. They just were snickering. Oh, <laughs> the C++ people. <laughs> now, I was a C++ guy at the time. And I didn't like that. And I had been dealing with language wars on the net for a couple of years. And I, I said to them at the time, do we really want to have language wars at Plop? And the interesting thing about there is not that they were snickering about it, because they probably had a right to do that. What was interesting about it was my reaction. My reaction was defensive. My reaction was, well, you guys go ahead and do your small talk thing, but I'm the one getting real work done. That's the interesting division that got set up at the time. And it was fairly pervasive. There was an attitude amongst the small talk community, and again, it's not an evil attitude. It's not one that's born out of ill will. But there was an attitude that said, you know, our tools are so good, our language is so good, 
we don't need to follow the rules. We can do something else. We don't have to talk to the other people. We don't have to do the other kinds of programs. And so there was this effect. Small talk people didn't want to do the regular kinds of programs. They didn't want to have to deal with the corporate database. They didn't want to have to deal with the horrible schema that had evolved for 20 years. It was distasteful. It, 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 was, it was abhorrent. And so they found ways instead to do things like using gemstone and, and nice little tools, and they built a little wall around themselves so that they could live in their technological bubble isolated from the evils of the outside world. By the way, the language wars, who won that war? The language war came down to dynamics versus statics. Who's won that war? Dynamics, dynamics have won the war hands down. Even all the static languages are now dynamic. Java, you know, C, C sharp. Nobody is actually doing C++ anymore, and even the ones who are doing C++, there are actually plenty of people doing C++, but it's not a growing community anymore. And even that language is adopting some dynamic -y kind of like things, although not exactly. But Java, Java has become a dynamic language. You can do anything you want to in Java. Reflection here and this, that, there. You want to call a private method? You can call a private method. Nothing will stop you from doing that. You want to take a string and turn it into a method call? You can do that. Any of the things you can do in a, in a dynamic language, you can do in these quasi-static languages, just not very convenient. I'm going to define a word here. It's a word you all know. And this definition is just one of many. Uh, we will find other definitions for this word. The word is professionalism. And I'm going to define it for the purpose of this talk as the disciplined wielding of power. We have a certain amount of power in our tools and our languages. But it requires a discipline to wield that power. And it's not just the discipline in the use of the tool. It's a discipline in the relationship to the community at large. It is a discipline that says, yes, this is a powerful tool, but powerful tools kill very quickly. And they kill in surprising ways, so we're going to be careful. And we're not going to... We're not going to denigrate people who are a little bit less willing to use our tool. Let us redefine progress to mean that just because we can do a thing, it does not necessarily follow that we must do that thing. Who said that? Kennedy. Yeah, it was the president of the United Federation of Planets in the year 2293, at the meeting uh, which brought the Klingons into the Federation. <laughs> what was it that killed small talk? It was parochialism, the inability to address the needs of the enterprise. <laughs> Stellar, small talk was a stellar performer in certain constrained circumstances, but it was limited in its ability, or rather in the desire of its users, to address the general problems of the enterprise. There was a certain purity amongst those people. They did not want to step outside and sully themselves in the soil of real work. There was an us versus them feeling of uncleanliness. And those of us on the other side of that boundary felt it palpably. Parochialism is an FU attitude. It's a way of putting a big banner on the screen saying, F you, I'm going to do it my way and screw the rest of you. It's a way to say, we are great in our own little domain and the rest of the world can go to hell. What might save Ruby and Rails and all of the other wonderful works that are going on in this community from that same demise. Now, frankly, I don't think it's anywhere near going down that road. First of all, 
the community is, I think, more dynamic and larger. And I believe that there's no longer the, um, the antithesis. Those of us who are strong C++ you know, hormonal programmers have relented. And everybody is looking around and going, you know, there might be something to this Ruby stuff. But still, what is it that might save... Ruby and Rails and all of those other things from going down the same path that small talk went down. I've named three things. The first one is discipline. Discipline specifically in test-driven development. I think if there is a technical discipline that can keep Ward Cunningham's problem from happening, it is test-driven development. I wear this green band. I wear it for a reason. It reminds me every time I sit down at my laptop that I am going to write tests. Come hell or high water, I am going to write tests. And by God, that is a hard thing to do. How many of you have found how hard it is sometimes to sit down and say, I'm going to write the damn test? You just want to write the code. I'm going to write the test first. And you're always glad you did. I've been lately writing a lot of um, HTML generation code. I've been doing a lot of GUI work. HTML GUI, not real GUI. And uh, I just want to see it on the screen. And it would be so easy for me to just go in and hack it and look on the screen and hack and look on the screen and hack and look on the screen. It would be so easy for me to do that. And if I did it, I would wind up without any tests. So I look at my green band and I go, damn it. And I write the tests. That is a tough discipline. It is the discipline of the doctor who washes his hands every time he leaves one patient and goes to a next. Anybody of you know doctors that don't do that or suspect? He comes in to examine, him, to examine you. I wonder if that man washed his hands. And if you didn't wash his hands, would you think him a professional? The professionalism of humility is something that may prevent the demise, the same kind of demise that occurred for small talk. The us versus them attitude. Now, I know that there have been some, some funny advertisements. I was here at a Rails conference a couple of years ago, and there was a very funny thing. It was based on the Mac versus PC thing. You know, I'm a Mac, I'm a PC, except it was, you know, I'm Rails, I'm Java. And it was very funny. And I laughed at it at the time. And I don't think there's any harm in that unless you take it too seriously. Unless you build the wall. Or unless they build the wall in response. And the last thing would be acceptance of solving the dirty problems. Solving the problems of the horrible schema. Uh, we'd want to be able to get our Rails application to work with this nasty schema that's evolved over years, and, and they never used any IDs in their rows, and they, they thought that COD normal sixth form was wonderful, and all of that stuff. And we're going to have to sit down and say, you know, we've got to deal with that. If, we're going to, if we are going to survive in the end, we have to address problems that everybody has. Otherwise, someone else will address those problems. Remember the fate of probably the most powerful and influential language of the 70s and 80s. The language that was at the start of OO. The language that influenced so much of what we are currently doing. The fate of that language was near oblivion. And the people who used it and loved it had to start writing Java for a living, and it nearly killed them. <laughs> we have a great tool in this language. We could kill it by making a mess. We could kill it by being arrogant about it. We could kill it by ignoring the enterprise. I suggest that we not follow that route. Thank you for your attention.
Okay. Can we get these lights down? Yeah, can we turn those on? Any way to turn those lights down? So we can see so the audience. Surely, surely you have questions. Um, and if you do, then you should go to the mics. And we've got time for about five minutes of questions. Then we're going to have to break for dinner and do lightning talks and all that stuff. Thank you very much for a fantastic presentation. I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, about Kent Beck's presentation last year. A lot of us felt, well, some of us anyway, felt that he was a little disappointed in the results of the community for XP, that it was kind of a social movement disguised as a programming technique. Can you talk about that for a minute? Um, I'm a techie. Uh, I, I like to write code. Uh, I wrote code on the airplane out here. I wrote code in the breaks between the talks. Uh, and if I'm still awake, I'll write code on the airplane back home. Uh, I, I want to be a techie. I'm not a social change agent. Or at least I don't think of myself that way. Um, I think XP, in some people's minds, was a social thing. Now, I believe XP and Agile is about people, certainly. But I don't think it was an, a social revolution. I don't think it was a, um, a new and exciting way to do things. I think it was, somebody once said that XP is the way programmers are observed to behave in the wild. <laughs> I think that's perfectly true. I think all of us would like to do XP if, if there weren't other things around us uh, that were preventing us. And, Therefore, when we can get close to that ideal, we feel pretty good about it. Was Kent disappointed? I really don't know. I, and I don't, I can't, I can't, I wasn't here for Kent's talk. I can't really figure out what Kent was worried about at the time, if anything. I can tell you what I feel. Right? I am not disappointed by anything that's happened in our community in the last, uh, well, I'll just say 10 years, but it's probably more like 25, because it seems to me like the arrow of our direction is the right arrow. Oh, maybe there's a few degrees left or right, we could shift it. But it seems to me that we have been doing the right things, that we have been moving in the right direction. Look what's happened in the last few years. Look at not just the technical advances, but the discipline advances. 20 years ago, we had no disciplines at all. Now, we have some disciplines, disciplines like test-driven development, disciplines like continuous integration, disciplines like pair programming. Anybody out there pair programming? <laughs> these, are, these are remarkable because we were a community of people who all did what was right in our own eyes, and we are transforming ourselves into a profession. We were not a profession before. But I think we are becoming one. And I think we are able to say to ourselves now, I am a professional. Because of what I do, because of the, the rules I follow, because of this silly damn green band on my arm, I am a professional. I have certain standards that I adhere to. I have certain rules that I follow, come hell or high water. And when the pressure mounts and when the deadline looms, I fall back on my disciplines, not on my fear. And that is what a professional does. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I really enjoyed saying that. Th thanks. So one of the, you mentioned that Kent said Ruby is like small talk without the image, and then you talked about small talk's great tools, refactoring tools, introspective tools. You kind of sneered at how Ruby doesn't have very much refactoring support. I think one of, the, one of the reasons for Ruby's success is it fits in really well with the Unix model. What are, what are some of the things that we can do to get that kind of productivity that Smalltalk had with their tools, but still kind of fit within the rest of the world and capitalize on, on Ruby working with, with uh, the existing tools? Oh, I think that's happening. Uh, you know, there, there are people trying to figure out how to, how to crack the refactoring nut uh, and, and are doing it. 
bit by bit, these tools that are coming out, you have your hand raising. Was that a question? Oh, you, you, you're writing one of those tools. Oh, you work for JetBrains. Well, OK, all right. So the, uh, the IntelliJ tool is a wonderful tool. And it can do reading. And it can do extract methods sometimes. So you know, it's, it's getting better. Getting better. I expect this to continue. I expect eventually we will have uh, you know, refactoring browsers that are every bit as powerful as the ones in Java. It's going to take some time. Uh, so I'm not too worried about that. What can we do to support these guys? The guys who are doing these IDEs are, are probably holding the key to the next 10 years. Right? So that's my opinion. Support those guys. TextMate's a great tool. Use TextMate. But keep an eye on these IDEs, because the IDEs will make the difference. I, you know, I still use VI sometimes. Right? But not for Java code. <laughs> We have enough time? Two more quick ones, yeah? Um, yes, I just wanted to, to get your thoughts on um, JRuby. Is that something that, you know, how this entire talk, I was thinking, is that something that helps, doesn't help, or doesn't matter? Um, I just wondered your opinion on it. Oh, I'm just so thrilled about JRuby. And it's even faster than Ruby is. And it, you can call it from Java, although I, I have yet to do that. And you can call Java from JRuby, and I have been able to do that. Charles Nutter is here somewhere. He's supposed to show me how I can call uh, Ruby from Java. I want to do that so much. Uh, I think that, that in this binding of the languages, these uh, languages that can run in the JVM, there's a lot of power. Uh, I think JRuby is a way to transition the Java community it, bit by bit, little bit by little bit, into using uh, dynamic languages uh, when it's more appropriate. And they can stay in the Java world as long as they'd like to or for whatever things they want to. I personally am writing a, a Java application, Fitness. I spend a lot of time writing it. And I am dying to be able to write bits of it in Ruby. I would love to be able to start writing all of my web generation stuff in Ruby and all of my XML generation stuff in Ruby. Uh, and I'm on the verge of starting to do that. So I think that's a real important issue. Yes? Um, so how do we avoid over-professionalism? Because I think that uh, enthusiasm is to a certain extent, like a lot of people are here be not because Java is statically typed, but because they had have had handcuffs on for so long and have been so professional. And they come here and they're like a kid in a candy store. And that breeds enthusiasm for the community and for people to just like go crazy writing whatever they want. And that doesn't necessarily, that isn't necessarily overly professional. A good example is there, I, I mean, I myself have abandoned tens of libraries over the years and that people may have wanted to use, but they were abandoned. That's not necessarily very professional, but that sh perhaps shows enthusiasm. I'm sure everybody has done that too. So there's a, there must be a fine balance in there. Over-professionalism is an interesting concept. Can you be too professional? No. <laughs> we have to be careful about the definition of the term. Uh, professionalism does not mean rigid formalism. Uh, professionalism does not mean uh, adhering to bureaucracy. Professionalism is honor. Professionalism is being honest with yourself and disciplined in the way you work. Professionalism is not letting fear take over. Uh, those of you who have had the, had the experience of having a deadline loom and you threw away all of your rules just to get the deadline done were behaving unprofessionally because you allowed fear to rule. A professional becomes calm when the pressure mounts. Uh, I've, I've given this metaphor before and I will close with this metaphor. Imagine that you are having an out-of-body experience. You are on an operating table, and you're out of body floating above it, watching the doctor perform open-heart surgery upon you. Now, here's a man who has a deadline, quite literally. Right? <laughs> He's got to get this operation done in a certain amount of time. How do you want him to behave? Calmly, following his rules, 
step by step, carefully adhering to his disciplines, or do you want him to behave like the hacker on his terminal? Fuck! Damn! Oh! Shit! 